Our stories today are about serial killers. That means that in this video, we're going to be talking about the horrifying and gruesome deaths of a lot of innocent people. If that's not something you can handle, then you may want to skip all the way to the end. But if you're ready to hear it, then... Hello and welcome to Back to Back Horror Stories, where we tell you two different strange and or creepy stories back to back. Make sure to watch to the end if you want to avoid being able to sleep tonight. And if you end up enjoying this video, please make sure to like, comment, and subscribe. Now, let's get started. The story I'm about to tell you is frankly so disturbing and so vile that I almost decided not to do it. But because there is a valuable lesson to learn about the impact of trauma and mental disorders on the human mind, I'm going to tell it to you right now. But viewer discretion is advised. In the year 1971, a man by the name of Leonard Lake was medically discharged from the Marine Corps after suffering a mental breakdown. By this point, he had already served two tours in Vietnam and doctors diagnosed him with something called impending schizophrenia. Now, although he had of course experienced a lot of trauma during the war, it wasn't as if he had always been normal his entire life. In fact, as a child, he had apparently took nude photos of his sisters and had even started mutilating and killing small animals by dissolving them in acid. All actions that seemed to be pretty common for future serial killers. But after his discharge, he actually started to fit in pretty well with the rest of society. He got a job as a clerk working in a store, he showed an aptitude for being able to fix things, and he even got married to a girl he met in San Jose in the year 1975. Now, granted, they both lived in a hippie commune and got divorced shortly after when she found out he was making his own adult films. But still, he could always find another woman. And he did. Her name was Cricket. And they too also lived in a hippie commune and got married. However, this honeymoon period of Leonard's life only ended up lasting for a few short years. And over a period of time, as often happens, Leonard once again began showing signs of being mentally disturbed. He became convinced that a nuclear holocaust was going to decimate the entire world's population. And so, in order to remain one of the sole remaining survivors of such an event, he converted his wife's cabin in the woods to a survivalist bunker and soon began living out there permanently. Now, while a lot of people might like the idea of living in a cabin in the woods away from the stresses of daily life, Leonard took it to a whole new, extremely sadistic, level. First, he invited two people he knew very well to the cabin. One was his little brother, Donald, and the other was his close friend, Charles Gunner, who had actually served as Leonard's best man during his second wedding. But despite the fact that these were close relationships, I mean, Donald was literally his brother, Leonard did not discriminate when it came to his victims. After luring them into the cabin, he then proceeded to murder both of them in their sleep and began to impersonate Gunner whenever he went out in public. Now having fully developed a reinvigorated lust for blood, he invited a man to the cabin that he had met through posting an advertisement in a survivalist magazine. And that man's name was Charles Eng. Although Leonard had posted the ad a few years before, in an attempt to lure in an unsuspecting victim, he ended up finding an accomplice instead. Charles Eng had apparently grown up in an eerily similar fashion to Leonard, and he too had also served in the Marine Corps. In addition, he just so happened to share the same grotesque and disturbing desires. They were almost like a set of of evil twins separated at birth or something. And now, only a few short years after meeting each other, Charles and Leonard embarked on one of the most brutal killing sprees in American history. But what was even worse was the way in which it was conducted. And by the way, here's where things start to get rather vulgar. If you're sensitive to these type of topics, you may want to avoid the next part. So first, let's backtrack to Leonard's teenage years. At some point during this time period, he had read a book called The Collector by John Fowles. In the book, a man captures and enslaves a woman named Miranda in the hope that she would eventually fall in love with him. Lake was apparently so fascinated by this novel that when he became an adult, he had the sick idea of eventually recreating it in real life. And by the point that Leonard had regrouped with Charles in the year 1983, he was already hell-bent on turning this vision into reality. And now that he had both an accomplice and an isolated cabin in the woods, he knew his plan was ready to take shape. Leonard called it Operation Miranda. The execution involved assembling a torture dungeon wherein they would keep and imprison and their female victims in order to have their way with them. The dungeon itself could only be accessed through a secret door in one of the walls of the cabin, and the actual cell itself was a six and a half by three and a half foot cinder block bunker containing only a single mattress and a bucket with a roll of toilet paper on the floor next to it. In addition, Leonard wrote a list of rules for all the female captives to follow and posted it up on the wall for all of them to see. When Leonard and Charles were finished with the women, it first killed them, then chop up their body parts, 
And finally, dissolve all the remains in acid, leaving no trace whatsoever. Along with women, they also murdered several men and children as well over the span of the years 1983 to 1985. And in late April of 1985, they kidnapped Leonard's neighbor, Lonnie Bond, his girlfriend, Brenda O'Connor, and their infant son, Lonnie Jr. After murdering Lonnie Bond and his infant son, Charles actually took a home film of Brenda before later killing her too. Here's a short clip that should explain the power dynamic between Leonard and his victims. While you're here, we'll keep you busy. You'll wash first, you'll clean first, cook first, you'll cook first. That's your choice in a nutshell. It's not much of a choice. Not long after the entire Bond slash O'Connor family was killed, their friends and relatives soon came looking for them. When these people showed up to the cabin, they first knocked on the door to introduce themselves, and then when they explained who they were and what they were searching for, they were invited in and they too became victims of the two serial killers. But as the saying goes, or maybe should go, all bad things have to come to an end. Now although Leonard and Charles were actually pretty good at eliminating any evidence of their crimes, they obviously both had serious character deficiencies. And Charles specifically had one major flaw. That is, that he was a kleptomaniac. Or in other words, he liked to steal things. One day, when Leonard and Charles were visiting a hardware store to get some tools, an employee caught Charles trying to steal a vice. And when the employee ultimately confronted him about it, he ran into the parking lot, threw the vice into the trunk of Leonard's car, and ran away on foot. Then the employee called the police. When Leonard stayed behind and tried to negotiate with them, the officer searched the vehicle and found the vice, along with a handgun equipped with an illegal silencer. Although Leonard offered to pay for the vice, the police officers on the scene arrested him for possession of an illegally modified weapon. After the officers that arrested him noticed that he bore no resemblance to the person depicted on his license, they became increasingly suspicious. They soon figured out that not only was it not him, but that the license actually belonged to a man named Robin Scott Stapley, who had been reported missing several weeks earlier. During the official interrogation, Leonard quickly realized that he was doomed. So he decided to confess to everything, including giving away the name of his accomplice. Then he excused himself to go to the bathroom and he ingested a cyanide capsule that he had actually sewn into the lining of his clothing. Leonard Lake was officially pronounced dead on June 6th of 1985. A month later, police finally ended up capturing Charles Eng as well, and he was found guilty on 11 counts of murder. When investigators finally visited Leonard Lake's cabin following his death, they found a mass gravesite near the cabin with the remains of a minimum of 11 bodies. In addition, they also found a hand-drawn map leading to two buckets containing envelopes with the names of all the victims, Leonard's handwritten journals, and two videotapes documenting some of the deaths. Unfortunately, by the time Leonard died, he had successfully recreated the sick vision depicted in his favorite book, and even added his own little twist. Every day, people get to where they're going by the use of a train. Most of the time, those people are just trying to get to work or home or somewhere they need to be. But with Angel Matarino Resendez, this just wasn't the case. He was born in Puebla, Mexico on August 1st of 1960. He was raised by a single mother until the age of six, and then he was sent to live with his aunt and uncle. About six years later, around the age of 12, he would then go back to live with his mother, but he really didn't have an established home, and he would just be out roaming the streets. At around 13 to 14, he was going to swim in a nearby river when a group of older boys took advantage of him. Sometime here is when he dropped out of school because according to prison records, he only had a 7th grade education level. At the age of 16, Angel started trying to illegally cross the border into America. He got arrested in Michigan in 1976 and was deported back to Mexico. Then three years later, in 1979, at the age of 19, he was arrested for severely beating an 88-year-old man inside of his home in Miami, Florida. He was then sent to prison for 20 years for assault and burglary, but he only ended up doing six years and got out in 1985. While in prison, apparently some inmates had taken advantage of him, but Angel was once again deported to his homeland, and within no time he was back in America. About a year later, in 1986, he started his vicious killings, and it didn't end for a long time. The first person he murdered was an unidentified homeless woman, and he shot her four times and dumped her body in an abandoned farmhouse. In a later interview he had with the police, he told them he killed her because she insulted him. Wow. And in June of that same year, he was arrested in Laredo, Texas, not because of the murder, but because he tried to get into the United States with a fake birth certificate, and then he was sentenced to 18 months in prison. I don't know when he went back to Mexico to have to sneak back into the United States, 
but I guess he was just country hopping. He served his time and got out and was again deported on October 2nd of 1987. Then a year later, he somehow found himself in St. Louis, Missouri, and he got arrested for fraudulently trying to apply for social security cards with false documents and a ton of charges, including being a felon in possession of a firearm. He was sentenced to 30 more months in prison and got out in May of 1991 and was yet again deported. Only two months later, on July 19th, he was back in Texas, and this time he murdered a 33-year-old man named Michael White. Angel shot him multiple times in the backyard of his home. For the next six years, Angel was going back and forth from Mexico to the United States, constantly getting arrested and constantly getting deported. From 1997 to 1999, he really picked up his speed, and he found the use of a train to be his best option to get away and commit heinous crimes. In March of 1997, he was back in America, this time in Florida, and his violent urges struck again. He murdered two runaway teenagers from Woodstock, Illinois by the names of Jesse Howell and Wendy Von Huben. They were engaged and he had bludgeoned Howell to death and left his body next to railroad tracks in Bellevue, Florida, and I'm not even going to say what he did to Wendy. It's just absolutely sick. A few months later, Angel encountered another young couple on the railroad tracks in Lexington, Kentucky. Their names were Holly Dunn and Christopher Mayer. They were out partying on a Thursday night and got a little bored, so they took some beers and went down to the railroad tracks. Angel decided to try and rob them, but instead took it a step further and took them hostage. He then tied them up and gagged them and killed Christopher Mayer. Angel then went over to Holly and he started beating her and she became unconscious. Luckily for her, her breathing was incredibly shallow and so Angel thought she died and he left. She woke up sometime later and was in immense pain, but she knew she had to get out of there and get help. Holly Dunn ended up being the sole survivor of Angel's attacks and wrote the book Soul Survivor, the inspiring true story of coming face to face with the infamous railroad killer. Angel, however, was not done his killing spree. In 1998, he killed three people from Georgia to Houston, Texas, all in a very similar manner. He would invade their homes, usually take advantage of them, and then proceed to take their lives. In Georgia, he murdered 87-year-old Leafy Mason and 81-year-old Whitney Byers, both of which lived very close to railroad tracks. And then a week later in Texas, he murdered 39-year-old pediatric neurologist Claude of Benton. This time, however, he left behind fingerprints and DNA evidence, which the police would later use to identify and capture him. In early 1999, Angel was back in Mexico with his wife. When did he get a wife? And how? But they lived in the small rural area of Rodeo, Mexico, and they were waiting on the birth of their daughter. Their daughter? When did he... But a few months later, spring came and Angel was back in America and he just wasn't satisfied with his previous killings. On May 2nd, he got off a train in Weimar, Texas and he spotted a house. That house was owned by 46-year-old pastor Norman Cernick and his wife 47-year-old Karen. Angel broke into their home and murdered both of them with a sledgehammer and then he proceeded to do some awful things to Karen's lifeless body. On June 1st of 1999, near the border of El Paso, Texas, he was captured by the Immigration and Naturalization Service and they deported him back to Mexico the next day on June 2nd. Are you kidding me? They were so close. Two days later, on June 4th, he was back in Texas and once again had murder on his mind. Angel found himself in Houston and he broke into the apartment of 26-year-old school teacher Noemi Dominguez. He took advantage of her and then bludgeoned her to death with a pickaxe and then he stole her car and drove to Fayette County. There, Angel had broken into yet another home, this time owned by 73-year-old Josephine Kavica, and he also bludgeoned her to death with the same pickaxe. On June 14th of 1999, the Los Angeles Times reported that investigators were looking for a Mexican drifter by the name of Rafael Resendez Ramirez, who was connected to six deaths in Texas and one in Kentucky, all very close to railroad tracks. The next day, on June 15th, Angel was out near the railroad tracks again, but this time in Gorham, Illinois. He saw 80-year-old George Morber Sr. out getting his morning paper, and so Angel broke into his house. There, he waited for George, and then he bound him up, and he shot him in the head with a shotgun. George's daughter, 52-year-old Carolyn Frederick, stopped by a little later to visit her father, and Angel was still there, and he then brutally beat her to death with a shotgun he just used with so much force that it actually broke in half. About a week later, on June 22nd, the Los Angeles Times reported that 
Rafael Resendez Ramirez was now on the FBI's top 10 most wanted list. The news and the police had his name wrong for a little bit. They were originally calling him Rafael. The investigators soon figured out that it was Angel Matarino Resendez behind all of these killings, and so Texas Rangers got in touch with his family and tried to get him to peacefully surrender. Angel's sister Manuela met with Texas Ranger Drew Carter, and she encouraged Angel to give himself up. On July 13th of 1999, Angel would walk over the border bridge from Mexico to El Paso, accompanied by his sister, two brothers, and a pastor. He shook hands with Ranger Carter, and he was then taken into custody. His sister Manuela ended up being awarded $86,000 for helping him surrender. Okay. At one of Angel's trials in the spring of 2000, specifically for the murder of Claudia Benton, he tried to plead not guilty for the reason of insanity. He claimed he was an avenging angel sent by God to punish those he thought were evil and deserved to die. I don't know about that one. The jury, however, did not care, and they found him guilty of capital murder. Soon, he would be sentenced to death, which is something that he actually asked for. Six years later, on June 27th of 2006, the state of Texas executed Angel Mat Torino Resendez by lethal injection. He asked for forgiveness from the families of his victims who attended his execution, and his final words were, I deserve what I am getting. I agree. All right, guys, that's going to do it for us today. If you enjoyed this video and want to see more of our content, our TikTok and our Instagram account is in the bio. Also, if you have any idea for videos you'd like us to make in the future, please let us know in the comments below, and it could end up being in a future video. Thank you for watching.